Uh, so good evening and um, I welcome you all to the um, second of our, our two webinars that we've delivered this week around core surgery recruitment for 2023. Uh, the webinar today really focuses on the portfolio assessment uh, and we hope I'll be able to take you through step by step that assessment uh, and what evidence would be submitted and the scoring criteria. Uh, my name is Senny Malvagan and I'm the chair of the Core Surgery Training and Advisory Committee and I also chair the Core Surgery Recruitment Steering Committee which advises NDRS uh, which is the governing body that delivers all specialty recruitment. Uh, now in the first webinar uh, we talked about the rationale for reasoning and therefore validation of the changes made from 2022 to 2023. Uh, that webinar was recorded uh, and we will be giving you details about how to access that if you missed it. And, and the key messages really from that webinar was that there was an absolute priority uh, to change core recruitment from 2022 because there was a real danger that if we delivered the same framework, we would not be able to deliver core surgery recruitment because of uh, the demand on assessor capacity and the resilience of that demand. And so that then stemmed on to talk about why we changed and the rationale for that. So I will leave all that with the first webinar uh, and we'll move on now to talk about the portfolio assessment where we have made some changes again with the validation given to you in the previous webinar. So before I start, I'm just going to go through um, the timelines and the process for recruitment for 2023. Uh, the advert is now up online on Oriel and applications can be submitted from 10 a.m. tomorrow. So we've got an application window from the 3rd of November to the 1st of December. All applicants will be invited through Oriel to submit their application and at the same time they will be asked to submit their self-assessment score for their portfolio. There will be a process of long listing that will take place following the application window closing and then no later than the 20th of December, all applicants will be invited to book their MSRA test slot. That test slot and that test window will be between the 5th of January and the 17th of January and more information around that is provided, but you can book that at a test centre or take it online. On the 31st of January, the portal will open for all applicants to upload the evidence to validate the self-assessment score they have previously submitted. That will remain open until the 10th of February. We will receive the results of your MSRA test by the 23rd of February. And during the time from the closing of the portal for evidence from the 10th of Feb to the 23rd, we will also be verifying uh, the portfolio evidence. What I will say is the MSRA tests will be made available to us so that we will only be verifying the top 1200 applicants from that MSRA test because all those applicants will have their portfolio evidence verified and all of them will be invited to interview. The invites to interview will come out on the 23rd of February and during that time between the results of MSRA and veri verification being released, there will be an appeals window open, uh, which will then close on the 28th of February. The interview window will be the 9th of March to the 22nd of March and subsequent offers will be made from there. So talking now about the portfolio assessment, the first and most important thing I need to convey to you is that although the portfolio assessment and the domains have changed, there are no additional achievements that will be asked of you for the 2023 portfolio assessment. In fact, the portfolio has been um, trimmed and, and, and slimmed down, but no new achievements will need to be evidenced for you. The changes to the portfolio in part have been mandated by MDRS changes, which will apply across all specialty recruitments, not just core surgery. And then some additional that uh, us in the steering group have also uh, commended. 
So the MDRS mandated changes are that there'll be no named courses. That MR MRCS Part A will not be permitted to be used as part of a scoring system and that no intercalated degrees can be used as part of a scoring system. Additionally to that, we have submitted further changes which include that no degrees will be used in the scoring system. We will not have a prizes section, though as you will see, a certain prize will remain in one of the domains. And also the leadership and management domain from the previous iterations of recruitment will no longer be assessed in the portfolio, but we will assess that in a slightly modified interview question at the interview phase. We have also amalgamated domains and included presentation achievements within multiple domains, as you will see as I go through those four domains. So the four domains that I shall be going through are number one, commitment to specialty. Number two, quality improvements in clinical audit. Number three, presentations and publications. And number four, teaching experience and training qualifications. Now, what I will say is that uh, at the end of each domain, uh, we will then break out to look at any questions that you will have submitted. And as always, we would ask you to submit them in the chat box uh, and we will look at those questions relevant to that domain before we then move on to the subsequent domains. So firstly, some generic portfolio guidance for you. Any achievements that are submitted, we set a timeline as to when they can be achieved, and that must have been undertaken after commencing medical school or your first undergraduate degree. So that's the starting point with which any achievements uh, will count. As we've said, you're invited to submit a self-assessment score with your application. Uh, and the window for uploading that evidence will then be subsequently opened. I would ask you to look at uh, the scoring criteria in each of the domains and select the single achievement that would award the highest score. This is important because we are asking you to submit that one single achievement against each domain. And to, in order to make sure this is fair, but also um, appropriate uh, in terms of uh, assessor time, any further achievements or any further evidence based on a second or third achievement will not be looked at and considered. So in the relevant domains, only one achievement will be assessed and there are also limits placed on the evidence uploaded. And this is really important. We try to be as explicit as possible in the guidance so that one, it reduces the burden on you of, of evidence that needs to be submitted, but also the burden on assessors. So any further evidence uploaded beyond that stipulated will just not be considered. Once you've submitted your evidence, uh, you'll no longer be able to edit or amend that evidence. And that's particularly true if you submit any appeals. Now, the evidence upload window, it's really important. That will be open prior to the results of the MSRA. So everyone will upload their evidence, but only the top 1200 applicants from the MSRA school will actually have that evidence verified and be invited to interview. So domain one, this is the commitment to specialty domain. And what I've got in front of you here is actually what is in the self-assessment guidance for applicants. So we'll just take a look at this and take a look at the different subsections that are going to be scored. So this will be familiar to you from um, the previous year's recruitment if you have seen that. So number one, we're looking at operative experience. We've slightly changed that scoring criteria to again expand the breadth of scoring that applicants can achieve um, and expand the number of cases. And the reason for this is we'd like to ensure that there is that breadth of scoring to help differentiate candidates who may have achieved more or less. So you'll see now that actually there's eight points uh, with eight points being delivered for um, being given to individuals who have an involvement in 40 or more cases. And this is from a verified logbook. And I'll go through after this slide the evidence that's required to obtain those scores. The next is the attendance surgical conferences. Uh, and again, that scoring is 
uh, wide to give us separation of applicants who may or may not have, have uh, um, undertaken more or less in terms of uh, surgical conferences. Uh, and there's, then there's the surgical experience. So the top scoring here, three points, is one of two achievements. The first is uh, undertaking elective in a surgical specialty. Uh, and the second is undertaking a surgical placement during their foundation training or equivalent, uh, which we've set as a minimum of 12 weeks. Now, in addition, we've maintained the COVID derogation here. Um, so the intent of a surgical placement is acceptable, but if due to any COVID redeployment, the full 12 weeks were not undertaken in a surgical department, that will still be acceptable to give you those full marks. So let's now look at the evidence that we require, and you'll find that in brackets, I'll be putting the number of pieces of evidence, therefore, that we require. So we'll start with the confirmation of surgical experience, and we're really looking at one single piece of evidence here. So this is a consolidation report for each specialty to include a summary sheet of the consolidation report that can be generated through the e-logbook. It must detail the number of procedures undertaken and the date range the operations are undertaken. It must be signed by a consultant to include their full name and GMC number or their national medical registration equivalent. These are all mandatory elements of what must be on the consolidation report. And this is to ensure fairness of that evidence that's submitted, that it is a true and accurate reflection of, the, uh, of what's been undertaken by the applicant. The date the consultant validated the summary sheet must also be there. And it's also important to say that any supervision status that includes assisting is included in that logbook number. So the only thing that's not included is observed. And again, it's important to say we do not need your entire logbook output that comes from the e-logbook. It's simply that consolidation report. So if you have it in multiple specialties, so general and plastics, there'll be more than one consolidation report. But if it's in simply one of the specialties that you generate that consolidation report, then it will be that single sheet of evidence with that information that we have requested. So then let's look at the evidence for confirmation of surgical conferences. And here I put up to three because up to three surgical conferences will qualify for points. But it's one single piece of evidence for each conference attended. And the evidence that's required is a copy of the conference attendance certificate detailing your name, the name of the conference and the organising body and the date of the conference. Now, what many conferences have in that attendance is that they will have registered for CPD points. So if that is there, it is appropriate that that should also be visible on your attendance certificate. And then now the evidence for that confirmation of either the surgical elective or the surgical placement or the surgical ta taster. So it is one of these three, noting that the surgical taster gives you two points where the others give you three. So you will only submit one piece of evidence here. So in the surgical elective, what is required is a signed letter or document on an official letterhead by your educational supervisor. And it must include the surgical placement in hospital, the dates that were undertaken, and the name of the supervisor with either their GMC number or their corresponding national medical registration equivalent. So those are mandatory pieces that should be on that evidence. The same also applies when we look at the surgical placement. We detail that signed letter or document on official letterhead and those three specific elements that must be present. Uh, which then correspond to actually what we want from the surgical elective. And the same applies to the surgical taster. So please do look at that carefully and make sure your evidence does include all of those elements. So that ends domain one. So I'm just going to pause there um, and I would ask um, our HE colleagues, so I think it's Alan, um, if there are any questions in the chat box about domain one now, 
we'll try to answer those before moving on to domain two. So the first uh, question I have is um, conferences organised by university societies, uh, but sponsored by one of the Royal Colleges. Um, do these claim points for the conference section? They do. So if they've been organised by a particular organising body um, and you have all the evidence, um, so uh, and if there are even CPD points attributed in which they may be if they're associated with a Royal College, then of course they do. They do count. Um, conferences, we understand, um, can be virtual or in person, um, but but it is a conference. So what we had for some people last year was people submitting this for an online webinar, which was an hour or two hours of time, and that's not necessarily a conference. So that's just important, to, just to, just to, uh, where there is a little bit of grey there. That that's an important distinction. Um, the next question is for the e -log Logbook, will we get full points if some of the procedures were only observed and not necessarily assisted as long as they are over 40? So as we've said, the observed do not count, so it's everything assisted and above. So unfortunately, anything observed will be knocked off your total of, of procedures. But observed really is that you haven't scrubbed up. So if you are scrubbed in that operating uh, uh, environment, you will inevitably be a system. Uh, next person is ask, uh, can we use um, ARCP certificates as evidence of surgical placements? These surgical placements are um, deemed in uh, your foundation. Um, and if you look at what we wish for, we want to try to keep it very standardised. Um, and, and so we're not permitting variations because variations create a lot of inconsistency with regards to scoring and scoring for our assessors. So we've made it quite clear that it is that single signed letter or document um, by your educational supervisor. Um, so we are sticking to that. So we're not permitting any alternate evidence. Can I count a conference if it is attended on the 30th of November before applications close, um, but then don't, but they have not been issued a conference certificate? So what you would need to do is to make sure that at the point of submission of your application, all achievements have been banked. So if you're submitting your application on the 1st of December and you've been to a conference on the 30th, that's perfectly acceptable. Um, because you have done that. Um, I don't think that you should be submitting um, that evidence if you are um, um, submitting your application prior to the conference, because you may then run into trouble, for example, if that conference is cancelled, if you're not able to attend, etc, etc. Um, so uh, even though you may have a commitment to attend it, it must be what you have attended at the point of you submitting your application. Next one is do virtual conferences count? Yeah, so as I said, virtual yeah. conferences do, but be very aware of the virtual webinar, which is one or two hours, which you did have a few people try to submit. That will not count as a conference. Uh, can your educational supervisor be non-surgical? Yes, there can be. Uh, because your educational supervisor and foundation may be with you over the whole year, um, and it's simply them to uh, confirm that you have been in that surgical placement, so of course, yeah. Do conferences attended during medical school count towards the three needed? Yes, they do. So if, if you remember at the very start of the presentation, I said this, the, the clock starts ticking in terms of your achievements that can count uh, from your first undergraduate degree or starting medical school, so yeah. Uh, again, for conferences, does it matter if it's regional versus, versus national? Uh, so we've not stipulated that. You have to bear with me with the medical jargon on this one. PYSTO SOCPY procedure count. Cystoscopy. Cystoscopy. Um, uh, Sorry, it does, although what I would say is you probably wouldn't be assisting in a cystoscopy. So unless you performed it as supervised, um, uh, I would say that that wouldn't count if you're just assisting a cystoscopy because that's a, but that, but that is a, that is a, a procedure like any endoscopy. Uh, another person has asked, if we have multiple consolidation reports signed by different consultants from different specialties, 
Um, can this be collated as one single PDF uh, submitted as one piece of evidence? So what I would say is that um, the output from e-logbook um, only gives you consolidation report when you drop down to an individual specialty. So plastic surgery, general surgery, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it will give you multiple consolidation reports if you submitted um, procedures that are deemed to be within the, 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 the database for that, that particular specialty. Um, so what I would say is, yes, when you've when you've assigned those, you can upload those as a one PDF with, with more than one page, of course, um, rather than submit it as several individual pieces of evidence. Yeah, uh, there's a few questions says about educational supervisors. So um, submitting piece of evidence, does it have to be signed off by the current educational supervisor or if they've done a previous placement, can they submit evidence? So it's the educational sign supervisor that, that is able to sign off that you have done that surgical placement or you've done that elective or you've done that taster. So if an educational supervisor is able to do that, that, that they are confident because they are putting their GMC number to it, then that can be that educational supervisor. OK, so domain two is the quality improvement and clinical audit. So what is new here is that we've revised some of the scoring for what would be um, uh, attributed to your achievements. But also, as I mentioned earlier, we're bringing presentation scores into multiple domains. And therefore, what you'll find is two tables that are within domain two of scoring. I'll take the most, uh, I'll take on the left side of the slide first of all. And this is actually your achievement in the quality improvement project or clinical audit. So you will see that the scoring is 8642 and the differentiation of eight is that you are leading in all aspects of that clinical audit, which means you have come up with the, um, the project, the question, you've devised the methodology, you've collected the data and you've presented it. Um, um, and it is surgically themed. So the notes there tell you about exactly what that is. And the important aspect about this is that you must have been involved in two cycles to qualify for anything more than two points on that scoring scale. So you'll only be eligible for the points four, six and eight if you can show that this is a closed loop audit or quip. And then the specific differences then between each of those is your level of involvement. So from six to four, it's a contributor versus lead and the top is if it's surgically themed. Two points will be awarded no matter how significant your involvement is in the audit if it only was one cycle. Now, once you've submitted that evidence and had that achievement, you can then qualify for presentation points provided that you have done a closed loop audit. So if you score only two points in domain one because you have been involved in a clinical audit or QI project, which is one cycle, you will not be eligible for the presentation points. But if you scored four or more, then you'll be eligible for the presentation points, which are five, three and one, depending on where you have presented that. And that is divided into national, regional and local. And in the appendix, we try to describe as well as we can what counts as a national, international, what's a regional and what's local. So let's now just go into what evidence is required for that. So what's important to say here, which is a slight difference to previous years, is that you can use the same quality improvement or clinical audit and put it forward in the publication domain if it can score in that domain. So for example, if you've done a quip and it subsequently got published, you can submit the quip in this domain for points and submit the publication in the publication domain. However, you cannot submit uh, the quip for presentation points elsewhere if you're also submitting them for the presentation points here in domain two. And that'll become more clear when we go to the publications and presentations domain.
So what are the evidence that we require? So in brackets here, I've got two. So there'll be two pieces of evidence that are required. So firstly, we would want a copy of your audit presentation that outlines the scope of the audit and the impact. So that is, what did it look to achieve? What were the findings? And what were the improvements that this delivered? Or just a summary of the project detailing that scope and impact of the project. So if you've done an audit report, um, that is valid instead of an audit presentation as long as those elements of what you've done, the scope and impact are actually described in that evidence. That's evidence number one. Now you'll see the and here. So this is the second piece of evidence. And the second piece of evidence now confirms what you've put down in your audit report or your presentation, which is a letter from your supervising consultant stating your level of involvement and that it satisfies the requirements described in the points table so that you have been the lead or that you've contributed the letter must be signed it can be a digital signature but it must reproduce the physical signature so it can't be a digital x and it must include as we quite consistently say across all pieces of evidence the name of the consultant, their GMC number or national medical registration equivalent and the date. So please look at all of that. We do want and will expect all of that for your evidence to score. Now then, if you're looking to get the presentation points, so this means you've scored at least four or more in your quip, a copy of your audit presentation must be provided. So if you remember from the last slide, you can either submit a copy of your audit presentation or a report on your audit. Well, we do need the audit presentation if we're gonna score you for the presentation points. And, so there's an and again, a letter of acceptance from the meeting where it was presented, confirming the project title, the presenting author, and the date. Now, what will also be acceptable here if you do not have that letter of acceptance is a copy of the meeting program displaying the project and the presenting author. That's domain two. So I'll just pause there and I'll hand back to Alan for any questions around that second domain and the evidence. Hi, Sonny, so I've placed a few uh, questions here. Uh, will a signed letter stating I presented my quip regionally nationally counts for evidence of presentation or is it strictly a letter of invitation? So, Again, what we're trying to do is to minimize variation in all evidence, because that is the most fair for all of you in terms of your appraisers consistently scoring that evidence. So what we require for your presentation, I think the question is on presentation, is that you must give a copy, a copy of that audit presentation, uh, and then you must give a, let, a, a letter of acceptance from the meeting or the meeting program. That is all that will be accepted. For well, the additional quip audit presentation points, the guidance the guidance doesn't say if there needs to be a poster or presentation. Are both acceptable? Yes. So um, if it's been presented uh, a, a, as a poster, um, then that will be acceptable. Um, but we do need that that same evidence of letter of acceptance here because it won't necessarily be in the meeting program there. So uh, yes. Uh, can two people work on an audit as joint leads um, and then how many leads are allowed on an audit? So I think you just need to question what it means to be a lead. So I'll just go back to that. So to be a lead, you must have in, been involved in the inception of the project, planning it, data collecting, data analysing, implementing the change and then doing that second cycle. So in practicality it's very unlikely there's more than two people that will have had that kind of executive involvement of that audit or qi project so it may be possible that there are two individuals that have done that level of of leading of the audit um, but what's really important is then the evidence of your supervisor 
to say that you did have that level of involvement in your audit, which is the letter which we've asked to be submitted. This one can can uh, equip or audit be an education project, uh, e.g. teaching surgical trainees. Um, so it can be. Uh, just need to be careful around that in terms of what that is and if you're using it there, um, then when we come to the teaching experience that you're not using it there as well. Um, and it needs to be a, a, a quip, so there needs to be a, um, a posed question, a standard, what you're doing, a review of that and then implementing change. So that can be done in any arena and it can be done in the education arena, but it just needs to adhere to all of those principles. Uh, and then your supervising consultant, because it will be registered as a, an order to equip, um, we'll, we'll need to obviously um, uh, provide the evidence that you were lead or however much your involvement was in that. Somebody's asked, where do we state national versus versus regional conference? Um, as consultant letter or copy of the presentation? So it should be in the letter of acceptance from the meeting. So the meeting letter of acceptance will be uh, letter headed with the meeting that you were um, um, accepted to present at. Or the meeting program will give us that and that will give us the validation of what it, if it's a national um, uh, meeting or a regional meeting. So just read out a few more and then before moving on to the next uh, section. Um, uh, when you say presentation points, does a poster at a national conference constitute top points? So um, it does, provided it meets all the same criteria. So your first author. Um, and you have that letter of acceptance uh, to say that you did attend and present it. Question, if I was a lead in one QI project, but presented a different QI project at, at a national level, can I get four points for that or do I need to have presented the project that I was lead of? The presentation points here relate specifically to your quip that you've submitted. If you have another, then you can use that to score in the presentation and publication section. Um, so again, when we go through that, that might become more clear to you. It will only be presentation points for the quip that you have submitted. Okay. And I think that probably leads us on quite nicely to going on and talking about presentation and publications to me. Um, so we'll do that. Now, if there's anything else, I, I think we, we'll just come back. OK, so presentations and publications. It's a really busy slide. I'm sorry about that, but there are a lot of scoring points here and levels of scoring points. Um, and, and so I just wanted to try to put that onto a single slide. So what you'll find here is that much of the descriptors are similar to the previous year, but we try to bring this as an amalgamated domain, really, with presentations and publications. So what you'll see is the scoring uh, tops out at 10 and goes down to zero. And at 10, there are two different levels of achievement that will give you that 10 points. So this is where we have brought across a particular prize. So 10 is I've won a prize for delivering an oral presentation at a national or international meeting uh, convened by an accredited institution. Important here, this is oral. So it doesn't include oral poster presentations, which are scored at a lower point scale. The second 10 point is I am first author of a PubMed cited publication or one in press that doesn't include a case report or editorial letter. And we've given descriptors uh, referencing the um, definition of what is a first author and also co-authors as well and collaborative authors. So as you'll see, as you walk down the scoring scale, it allows for achievements either in oral presentation, in a publication, in prize winning for either an oral presentation or a poster presentation, or for first author in two or more posters, uh, which can be orally or, or, or delivered uh, um, um, as a display. Or 
small first author where it's case report or editorial letter, which is scored lower than the original art, uh, uh, an original article. There's also scoring here if you've written a book chapter and then also scoring if you're a cited collaborative author. So quite a lot on the point scale. Please do look at that carefully and see what your achievement matches most appropriately. There are lots of different achievements here that can score sometimes the same points. Just a bit of um, clarification around that, and this is all in the guidance notes. Oral, oral presentations referred to will be with or without slides in front of an audience of health care professionals. Can be related to uh, anything related to medicine, typically a case or case series research or other topic. We would normally expect it to include a Q&A session after your presentation. Poster presentations referred to are given with one poster or a poster slide and sometimes a very short oral explanation. So that's the difference between an oral poster presentation. And it may or may not have a Q&A session afterwards. If a poster is shown without that accompanying oral presentation, you can still claim the points in line with the relevant point scoring. All the presentations require either personal or virtual attendance at the meeting. If you've used equip for presentation points in domain two, then you cannot use it again to score for presentation points, but you can use it if a publication uh, um, was delivered with that same project. The publications are accepted for points if they've been accepted by a PubMed catalog journal. Or if you've had provide if you provide acceptance for that publication without amendments and evidence of the PubMed status of the journal is also provided. So that leads me on to actually talking about then what evidence do we ask you to submit? So for oral and poster presentations, there will be three pieces of evidence that we're going to ask you to submit. Number one, a copy of your presentation slides or poster presentation, including that title and including the name of the first author or author list to include the applicant if you're not the first author. And number two, a copy of the letter of acceptance of that oral poster presentation or a copy of the event programme, which actually cites the presentation and includes the name of the presenter, the institution uh, convening the meeting and the date of the meeting or presentation. And then number three, your certificate of attendance at the event. So all three are mandatory to, to give the evidence to score the points there. If you are cl claiming a prize, in addition, the following is also required, and that is a copy of the prize certificate or signed letter from the institution conferring the prize. If it is a regional local meeting, a letter from an educational supervisor with that above information is acceptable, but that will not be acceptable for a national or international meeting where there will be a letter conferring that prize to you. So for all published art articles, um, as first author or co-author, we use the ICJME criteria. A link to that is in the applicant guidance, so please look at that to, to determine whether you're, if you're unsure about whether you are a first author or a co-author or actually a collaborative author. A copy of the article, including the PubMed ID is required, and a letter of acceptance of pub, for publication from the accepting PubMed catalogue journal. And that must include one name of the applicant as the first author, confirmation of acceptance for publication without alteration, name of the accepting journal, date of acceptance and title of article. Now, for articles in press, so these haven't already been published, what we require is that letter of acceptance for publication from that a uh, PubMed catalog journal to include the name of the applicant, confirmation of acceptance, 
name of journal, date of acceptance, title of article, and also a statement confirming that the journal is PubMed cited. So if you are a collaborative author on that scoring system, then the evidence that is required is one, a copy of the published article to include one, the title of the article, the name of the journal, the PubMed ID, and the article page where the collaborative authors are cited. So often with collaborative authors, there's quite a large number of them and there will be a page where you're all cited and we would want to see that uh, in the published article evidence that you submit. For a book chapter, what we require is one, the front and back cover of the book to include the title of the book, the publishing house and the ISBN number and the contents page showing the chapter and the applicant as the author. So although we're talking about a lot of evidence here, actually you'll only be submitting one of these because your achievement will only be one of book chapter, collaborative author, a publication, an oral or poster presentation, plus or minus a prize. That's presentations and publications. So I'll stop there. Uh, and Alan, any questions there? Uh, yep, so we have a fair few. Um, so I'll start with this one. So if you have oral presentation um, first or for publication, do you submit both? So you can only score once. So if you're a first author, it's a PubMed cited publication and it's not a case report or editorial, you'll score 10 points. If you have won an oral prize, a uh, prize for an oral presentation, you score 10 points. So you just submit the single piece of evidence that gives you the highest score. So there's a couple of questions about um, publication. So if I've submitted a uh, publication to PubMed, but hasn't been indexed or hasn't been given a PubMed ID, um, will I still score points? Yes, so if you look at the articles in press, we want a letter of acceptance for the publication from that PubMed catalogue journal. So you'll know that the journal is PubMed catalogue because you can search that. We want those six elements of evidence uh, with that letter of acceptance. Uh, and if you can actually give the PubMed's um, uh, catalogue for, for that journal, then, then that gives you the statement confirming that the journal is PubMed cited. So yes, it will count, but that's what we need. Another one is, can you clarify the fact about electronic signature must be a reproduced version of physical signature? Uh, so a lot of consultants are now signing letters online using Adobe where they can type instead of uh, drawing. Is this an acceptable signature? The reason we put this in is that uh, questions are raised about literally an X being placed. Um, so if individuals are using that Adobe function, um, it will have a validation to that signature. Um, so that's a validated digital signature, which actually has their name uh, and, and that. So that is acceptable, uh, but simply an X is not acceptable. And that's the reason why we put that in to, to really sort of firm up that. Does an email of acceptance count or does it need to be an official letter? It needs to be that letter of acceptance for publication. So often the journal will send that to you electronically, um, uh, but that does need to be there. Um, and, and that should be there um, in terms of the confirmation of your letter of accept your acceptance. Somebody's asked, do certificates of presentation rather than the letter count? So when we look at uh, the presentation and for all oral and poster presentations, we need a copy of the oral presentation. So that's important. And a copy of the letter of acceptance uh, that you have presented that. Um, so that is what we're asking for and certificate of attendance. So there's three things that you must provide and, and that's what we will, we will require. Somebody's asked, does all in brackets Wales count as national? We've given some guidance on this uh, in terms of what is regional and what isn't. Uh, and the, the guidance sits with actually a deanery level as being regional. So we are looking at something that's open UK wide nationally uh, as a nat national um, um, uh, uh, meeting. 
if a meeting has been organised in one of the um, four UK nations and is open to applicants or uh, attendees from all four UK nations or internationally, then that is a national meeting. If it is a meeting in Wales for Welsh delegates, that is equivalent to a meeting in, in the West Midlands deanery, for example, for West Midlands delegates. So that is deemed regional. What here, what constitutes uh, an accredited institution? So what we would want uh, is uh, an institution, ideally, that has got CPD points attributed to its meeting. Um, and that is the that is the most secure way in terms of um, you ensuring that's an accredited institution. Um, it's difficult to give a very blanket, explicit thing other than that, uh, because um, uh, some institutions may not have had that. But but if there are online institutions, uh, for profit uh, um, uh, sort of web based institutions, then 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 you will know that that that's that that is an accredited institution. But certainly if an institution has held a meeting with CPD points, it has been accredited. I'll make this the last one. I think, so somebody's asked if you have presented a poster presentation at a national conference but did not win a prize, um, is the maximum number of points just one? So you presented a poster uh, just just so what was the criteria that they had said? Sorry, say that again, Alan. A uh, poster presentation at a national conference but did not win a prize. So if you look at what I'm putting up here, I've delivered an oral presentation. So um, that's that is oral with slides. If it's a poster presentation, um, and it's just a single poster presentation, uh, then unfortunately it does sit at it, it does sit at that lower um, uh, that lower end. So um, it doesn't qualify for any higher points. Um, it's the second poster presentation that then qualifies for the four. So I would certainly look at, is there any other achievements you have that score higher? Shall we move on then to the final domain? So the final domain is teaching experience and training qualifications. So two elements amalgamated into a single domain. And so what we've got is scoring uh, on the left hand side for teaching experience and scoring on the right hand side for training qualifications. So separate scoring and you will get a score for each of those if you submit evidence for each of those. So when we look at teaching experience, it's very much slimmed down from last year and it's just three scoring levels, 10, 6 and 2. And it refers to at the highest point scale, worked with local or, or even regional national educators to design and organise a teaching programme and we stipulate that that must be a series of sessions defined as four or more to enhance uh, organised teaching for healthcare professionals or medical students at a regional level. And again, please see the appendix for how we define regional. So if it's more than that, national, then of course that, that also qualifies. And we put some additional guidance notes here into what we kind of expect. So it's the ability to identify a gap in the teaching, worked with educators, you've actually designed, organised and delivered that teaching programme. Uh, and so that means you'll have had input into the programme objectives and outline the sessions that have been delivered. You then drop down uh, if you've done the same, but it is at a local level. Uh, and then drop down again if you have provided regular teaching again four sessions or more but not been involved in that design element and leading that then when we look on the right hand side this is very specific to training qualifications so again we use the ISCED level and that's important because for international applicants we need that equivalency uh, and the level goes from a master's or above scoring the highest points to a a PG diploma and to a PG cert and then to having had substantial training in teaching methods that should last at least two days. So a two day course, for example, uh, but it could include a module which forms part of a teaching qualification or master's level program. So if you've registered into a master's level program uh, and you haven't quite done the PG cert, but you've done sufficient 
um, uh, training to meet that two day stipulation, you will get that lowest point uh, scale. And that can be delivered virtually. OK, so now let's look at the evidence that we require for that domain. So first of all, evidence of formal feedback is required for all teaching experience so no matter what point score you you're going to be attributed we do need that formal feedback and that formal feedback describes either evidence of senior observation or feedback from delegates this could be observation of a teaching assessment uh, developing the teacher uh, assessment form or actual individual feedback so therefore there's the or which is the collection and analysis of participant feedback forms. So one of the two is deemed suitable evidence that you have had formal feedback. Now that formal feedback does not need to be submitted as evidence, but you must present that to be reviewed by your consultant. From there, the evidence that is required is listed and may just be the single piece of evidence you submit. And that is a letter from your consultant confirming your involvement in designing and organising the teaching programme as we've elaborated in the uh, additional notes. And the letter must be signed. Again, that electronic um, signature is permittable with the caveats we've already discussed and must include that consultant name, GMC number and dates of activity. And or you can submit a letter from the consultant confirming your involvement in delivering the teaching and that that participant formal feedback has been reviewed as acceptable. So that's important that um, you either get a letter confirming your involvement in the programme and a letter about your formal feedback or actually put all that together so that both of that is commented upon by your um, consultant who is signing that. Now, just to kind of elaborate, because it's often a, a point of contention about what is local, what is regional, we have given additional notes, but what we deem as local is delivery of teaching within a single department or a single hospital site. So what we know is that uh, some trusts have two or more hospital sites. And it is deemed regional if your delivery of teaching does span two or more hospital sites, uh, or trusts, or a foundation school or a regional association. All postgraduate degrees and qualifications, as I've said, must adhere to that ISCED classification. And again, we've given the links to that in our additional notes. So what do we require? So requirements of evidence to give you the points in the degrees section here is number one, a copy of the degree or postgraduate qualification certificate to include the applicant name, the awarding institution and the date of the award. Or, so as I say, there's two ors here, so you'll just need to submit one of these, a copy of the certificate confirming attendance at that substantial training in teaching methods, which is a minimum of two days, to include the applicant name, institution and date, or a copy of a certificate confirming attendance in teaching methods to include, again, the applicant name, institution and date of award. That's domain four. Um, so I'll just pass back to Alan then for any questions there. So there's, there's quite a few questions coming into the chat at the moment. Um, so I'll start with the latest one I've managed to find. So somebody's asked, what's the rationale for removing extra degrees, intercalated uh, degrees, but keeping teaching degrees? So uh, part of that's been mandated. So that has been mandated to be removed from all specialty recruitment. So intercalated degrees, for example, um, uh, that, that is a mandated thing that no specialty recruitment will actually be allowed to score for. Um, and what we are looking for is differentiating uh, elements in terms of um, um, trainees performance uh, in um, um, that postgraduate environment, that foundation environment, which is where they're coming from. Um, so what we found is, is that uh, in terms of um, additional degrees, we're looking at how that has that particular relevance um, for the domains we're looking at. And we prioritise teaching experience and training in teaching as an essential component um, for all trainees 
that's in their core, in their higher specialty, and then ultimately the product at the end when they become consultants. Um, so this is a marker to tell us about those individuals um, who um, are achieving in that element, which is an important part of being a surgeon and then ultimately a surgical trainer. So we prioritise that. One of the challenges around um, other degrees um, is again the idea of consistency of degrees and what qualifies for what and we must be fair and consistent for UK graduates and international graduates and international graduates uh, often it's a very uh, it's almost impossible uh, to provide comparisons uh, for some of their undergraduate degrees to, to, to UK and actually then ascertaining the value of those uh, and the value of those moving forward in, in, in surgical training. So a, a lot of this is to try to maintain consistency of scoring so that it's fair to all applicants, that there's that consistency of scoring for assessors, but also looking at, at those elements that will be important as a consultant in surgery uh, and as you're training in surgery and actually those um, that can be measurable consistently. So moving on to some about teaching. So uh, does delivering a teaching program to medical students from two different universities count as regional? So again, I think there's some discussions about what constitutes local and regional if it's trusts but based at two different sites. Yeah, so that if it's trust two different sites, that's regional. So so yeah, so it, it is really only if you're 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 delivering that teaching in a single hospital site or single department. Anything more than that, you take yourself out of the local level. Is asked how would you like us to present uh, formal feedback from students? So as I've said there, we do not uh, formal feedback does not need to be submitted as evidence, but must be reviewed by your consultant. So what evidence do we require? It's that letter from your consultant confirming your involvement in delivery of teaching and that formal feedback has been reviewed as acceptable. So it's a comment on the letter from your consultant. We do not need that formal feedback um, uh, submitted. Again, there's a number of questions about teaching experience uh, and when this was done. So does it have to be done? Does teaching experience have to be done within the last clinical year or can it be done uh, prior? Yeah. yeah, so at the very top of the piece, as I said, where does the start point? Where is the clock ticking from? The clock starts ticking from uh, your undergraduate degree, first undergraduate degree or medical school. So if you meet this, the criteria for for teaching experience that we've we've tried to be as explicit as possible, that achievement can happen in your undergraduate um, career. Can your evidence of teaching without consultant review? Yeah, your evidence of teaching um, uh, must have a letter from a consultant confirming the involvement. So as I've said to you, uh, as I've said um, in this presentation already, we are trying to be as consistent as possible to be as fair to all applicants that they will all be scored um, uh, consistently by all assessors. So there are certain evidence that we are asking for without any deviation from that. So as I've said here, you do need a letter from a consultant confirming your involvement in designing and organising that teaching programme. Even in your undergraduate career, um, you will have a particular individual who will be a consultant in that department or faculty who will have uh, uh, helped and, and supported you doing that programme. So there will be an individual uh, who will be able to do that uh, and uh, um, confirm that involvement. Uh, so I've got a couple of questions about training qualifications, then there's some generic ones. I'll probably just go through. Um, so does the PG, PG cert have to be in medical education to count? So um, this is about training qualifications. So as we put in the scoring table here, teaching specific postgraduate qualification, that is what we are counting. So it must be a PG cert in um, medical education, training, teaching, etc. Another person's asked, I've uh, completed fellowship in of higher education academy normally awarded after completing PG cert in medical education, but they won't uh, receive the PG cert in time of application. Does the FHEA count as PG qualification? So you would have had your PG certificate uh, confirmation from your awarding body once it was awarded. 
you may not have had the actual degree come through, but you would have had um, uh, um, uh, that that um, copy of 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 uh, confirmation of that. So if your degree qualification hasn't come through yet, there will be there will be some formal correspondence from your institution confirming that they're conferring that award onto you. And if that is there, then we need that with the applicant name, the awarding institution and the date that they awarded um, that. So then just just finally, um, key points about the portfolio portfolio evidence. Choose the highest scoring achievement to submit. Submitting more than one achievement is not acceptable, so don't chance it and just put multiple achievements, assuming we'll look at all of them and we will give you the points for what we have felt is the highest score. You need to do that. We won't look at any further achievements over and above the first one. Read the instructions carefully, the guidance notes and check off the evidence submitted against each of the requirements. We try to really focus on the clarity of that. There is no deviation. We're limiting any grey. That's the evidence that we require. So please do submit that evidence. Take care with your evidence submission. Focus on the clarity of the presentation, the information required. So really do try to make it as easy for any assessor looking at it. That they can pick out those elements. And then do not submit your quip achievement to double score if you've used it for presentation points in domain two. Then do not submit the same for domain three because it will not be awarded the presentation points there. So we'll go on to sort of any final generic questions. I would say. So, so there is quite a lot of questions obviously concerning about the scoring criteria, um, probably based about people's own experiences. So some of the generic ones is um, when do we get access to the document? So just to say the document is now live. On the course surgery advert, which has been published on Oreo. Um, Another person's asked, does all your evidence have to be completed before the 1st of December when applications close? So um, what you would need is you would need to submit your self-assessment score. Um, that is then your commitment to saying that you have the evidence to back up that self-assessment score. All I would say is that if you feel that you've got that score, you need that final sign off, or certainly in terms of signing off your logbook, um, that may not be done, but you know that that evidence is there on the logbook and it's just a case of signing it off, okay. But just be careful um, in, in what you're doing because you will not be able to change that self-assessment score um, and you will then be looked at to see what evidence is there to match that self-assessment score in the verification. Uh, so somebody's asked, why can't we upload more than one piece of evidence? Um, and if a reviewers underscore them incorrectly for that piece of evidence, um, can they not review a second piece of evidence for that criteria? So we've tried to give as great a clarity as possible, so you will know how we will mark and score these uh, achievements. If you're sitting in the grey, um, you know you're going to be at risk if, if you haven't got the evidence that we have asked for. Um, we will not look at further achievements, and this goes back to partly uh, trying to minimise the burden for yourself in submitting multiple, but also the burden on assessors. And that's a really important part of what we talked about in webinar one, which is that um, the burden on the assessors, assessors for what we have done in the previous round meant that if we did the same thing this time around, we just couldn't deliver core surgery recruitment and that is a disaster all round. So we are aiming at minimising um, the, the, the evidence, but also making sure that, that, that it's fair what we're asking of you so you know exactly what you will be scored on um, and that clarity um, is there uh, and we've tried to eliminate any areas where there's been lack of clarity. Uh, so I've got a couple of questions from foreign applicants and they're asking if some of their teaching evidence would be acceptable um, that's been completed abroad. So if you've undertaken, so we, you know, if you're undertaking teaching and it's in another country, um, then as long as it meets the criteria so that you have either designed it or that you've been involved in regular teaching, which has been to healthcare professionals or medical students, you've given four or more of those sessions, 
and examples of those could be bedside, classroom, teaching, acting as a mentor, etc. And then you can submit the evidence, which is a letter from your consultant confirming your involvement in that and that formal feedback has been reviewed and that is acceptable. Do two different local teaching programmes count as regional or is it just two times local programmes? So if you have done a teaching programme uh, and you've delivered both in the same unit, then that's a local programme. If you delivered that programme and it's in multiple hospital sites, then you come out of that local area. But if it's just a different programme, but you've delivered it at a single site again, that's local. Make this last question. If I'm teaching at university, is it acceptable for the letter to be signed by the vice dean at the, of the university, uh, not a consultant? Yeah, that's acceptable. Okay. That's it. Thanks, Sonny. Okay, well, um, thank you very much, everybody, for your time. And as I said, we'll distribute out to you um, where this recording will be um, uh, for your reference and for those colleagues who've not been able to attend today. Okay, thank you and all the best.